Good morning to you, brothers and sisters. Um, uh, I'm back. I was also having a break. I really enjoyed having a break for two weeks, and I just want to thank God for that. And uh, I thank you for your prayers. While it's way away, may God bless you. Let us pray. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. May our worship lead us to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, to lead the blind, let the oppressed go free, and proclaim the Lord's favor. May the words that we use in our worship be formed by God and remain focused on Jesus and filled with the Holy Spirit. Creative God, by your word comes life. Forgiving God, by your word comes love. Empowering God, by your word comes liberation. Speak your word to us now, and our lives shall proclaim your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to call my brother Ben to come and do the reading of the word of God from two reading texts. The first one, Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, 5 to 6, and then 8 to 10. Then Luke chapter 4, verses 14 to 21. So, Brother Ben, please come and do the reading of the Word of God. Good morning and praise God. It's great to be here again and reading the Word of God. It's uh, also uh, great to have Johnson back for his wisdom and strength. It's also been great to have Russell's uh, messages as well. They've been fantastic. As uh, Johnson mentioned, um, we'll be reading from Nehemiah 8 and verses 1 to 10 and 1 and Luke, but start with Nehemiah. And it's about Ezra reads the law. When the seven months came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra the scribe to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly which was made up of men and women of all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a high wooden platform built for the occasion. Beside him on his right stood Mattathiah, Shammah, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Masiah, and on his left were Padiah, Mishael, Malkajah, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshalem. Ezra opened the book, all the people who could see, because he was standing above them, and as he opened it, the people all stood up. Ezra praised the Lord, the great God, and all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. But then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. The Levites, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akab, Shabbatai, Hadiah, Masiah, Keltiah, Azariah, jo Josabad, Hanan, and Peliah instructed the people of the law while the people were standing there. They read the book, read from the book of the law of God, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people could understand what was being read. Then Nehemiah the governor, Ezra the priest, and scribe, and the Levites who were instructing the people said to them all, this day is sacred to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. Nehemiah said, 
go enjoy choice food and sweet drinks and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is sacred to our Lord. Do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The, Le the Levites ca uh, calmed the Levites calmed all the people, saying, "Be still, for this is a sacred day. Do not grieve." Amen. Amen. Uh, now, Luke four, fourteen to twenty-one. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in the synagogues and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth where he had been brought up and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet of Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he had anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began saying to them, Today the script, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the word of the Lord for this week. It's going to be interesting what Johnson's got to bring. I can't wait. So uh, let's all give him our attention and get ready. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Johnson. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Ben, uh, for the reading of the word of God. I also want to thank you, Brother Ben and to Reverend Russell, for doing the work of God, allowing me to take a break. I really want to thank you and appreciate what you are doing. May God continue to bless you and use you in his vineyard. Uh, this morning, I've decided to share with you, brothers and sisters, on the theme, Spirit-Powered Anointing. Spirit-powered anointing. The word anointing is a term that means that the Holy Spirit is with you. And that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. When you are anointed, you are not only empowered but commissioned into action. So anointing is derived from the Greek verb kreo, which means anointing or oil of gladness, which corresponds with the Greek noun charisma which is a pouring out upon or into from without. So this one meaning of the word anointing, it is something that moves from without to within, from within to without. That is what it means. So it is something conferred by God through the movement of the Holy Spirit. Also related to Christos, anointed one, the word we call Messiah. So Jesus has been contracted by God with the power of the divine Holy Spirit to impart good news of God's favor and grace. So this inauguration of Jesus' ministry occurred after his baptism. At that time when we are told that the Holy Spirit came upon him in a big and powerful way, christening him into a ministry of mercy in order to fulfill God's vision of bringing humanity warm to his original state of relational harmony with God. So Jesus would be a sacrificial lamb. The sin offering and the medium of atonement. He would also declare justice, but not the kind you might expect. Not the kind of his family and neighbors expected. Not the kind of any of us expect either. So if there's one thing about Jesus, he is always turning the tables on our expectations. And this scripture is no different. Anointing was typical for prophets, priests, and kings. By saying that he was anointed by God, Jesus is pointing to himself in the role of one or of these. But there is more. So Jesus also chose to read a passage of scripture from the Isaiah scroll, which points to the theme of the Jewish law concept of Jubilee. 
a theme that we also point to, to him as a messianic figure. For Jesus ends the reading with the words, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled just as you heard it. So when Jesus read it from the Isaiah scroll at the Nazareth synagogue, the text that he proclaimed is to these dreams of power and might on their head. Isaiah's words proclaimed to the Jews that within their own community, it would be the poor, the blind, and the oppressed who would be released, who would receive the focus of divine activity in the new messianic era. It will not be the most obedient people you think of, not the most devout people, not those who prayed most earnestly and fervently, not those whose piety was unpeachable, not those whose learning was deep, not those who were wise, not those who were strong, the poor, the poor. So the poor made all those with poor status. In the Mediterranean world, the poor had bad genes. Bad reputations, bad health, bad histories, bad credit scores, bad clothing, bad neighborhoods, bad relatives, bad habits. The poor are the undesirable people. The poor wasn't just physical bankrupt. They were spiritually bankrupt when they were considered according to the Jewish. So how, would, how could the Messiah be anointed and appointed for such people. <laughs> the blind meant not only those with physical blindness, but those who suffered from spiritual blindness as well. Physical handicaps, infectious diseases, infirmities, and physical deficiencies were all assumed to be a sign of divine judgment. If you were suffering, you should have something happened to you. So Jesus is talking now that the blind will see. He has come for these people. If you were blind, sick, or lame, or diseased, you were assumed to have been done something to deserve it. How could Jesus possibly imagine that the newest action of God would be directed towards those most obvious outcasts? Jesus didn't even re repeat the most self-satisfied portion of the Isaiah text he was reading. He ends with the declaration to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In Isaiah 62, 61 verse 2. Much like Ezra and Nehemiah before him, Jesus is proclaiming a season of joy, a time of release, a great restoration, a time of to part. It's a homecoming celebration, but not the kind you might think. Truly, to understand what Jesus is doing here, we need to go back in time. And we need a little understanding of the meaning of the year of Jubilee. Noting that God rested on the seventh day, we celebrate Sabbath, a day of rest and commitment, God. But Jubilee takes this further. In agriculture, every seven years, the land was to lay fallow so as to receive replenishment of the soil so that the soil gathers together and bring back its richness. At the end of the seventh of those seven years, a jubilee year is declared, a year of liberation, a freedom and restoration. This was declared in what Ezra calls the instruction scroll and the scrolls of Leviticus that come from Leviticus 25, chapter, and you shall, it says, and you shall hallow the fifth year. You shall proclaim release throughout the land of all its inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you. Each of you shall return to his holding. And each of you shall return to his family. That fifth year shall be a jubilee for you. Verse 3. You shall not sow, neither shall you reap the aftergrowth of harvest, the untrimmed vines. Leviticus uh, 25, verse 10 and 11. There's three decrees to be carried out in this year. Release of enslaved Israelites return of lands that has been sold to their first owners in the sabbatical fallow year. So in other ways, for the refugees from Persia in Ezra and Nehemiah's time, this news was of a grand homecoming celebration with joy abounding for all. 
It was a restoration of life, land, culture, and families, and well-being, and restitution for wrongdoing. It was a time of celebration for them. But for Ezra and Nehemiah, this reading was also a thematic jubilee proclamation that God would renew his covenant and that God's people be restored in spirit. This is a reconstitution in which God's people were to leave their past behind and create a new era of promise and abundance. So in this, God's people were reminded that God is the source of strength. That is the last part. They are not to look back and to hold grudges. They have been called blessed to be a blessing. So you also have been called to be blessed so that you can become a blessing. As their heritage in this, they are called to great joy. They have been freed. They have been liberated and returned to their homes. Under Nehemiah's direction, the walls of Jerusalem were rebuilt, restoring physical security to the city's populace. But Nehemiah also helped to restore the moral fiber of community by inspiring that the division between the rich and the poor be diminished. So you can see these words. He forbade the land grabbing, freedom robbing practice of the wealth that put the poor into slavery and the community into disarray. So in building the city walls, Nehemiah helped once again cement the bones of the community that made everyone responsible and for one another. So God is a God of second chances, of new beginnings, of transformation. I always say, when we say we are starting a new year, it's a new year of new beginnings. New beginnings. God will again be present among the people and guiding them in the future as they take back what was theirs and remake their homes in the land of promise. Ezra and Nehemiah read this scroll and made this declaration during the Jewish feast of Tabernacles, a time when the Jewish people celebrated God's presence among them. So the overarching celebration for these returning exiles of the time would have been freedom from oppression by foreigners. Why is that so important? Why is that so important? Here's where Jesus sends the table. In Jesus' proclamation, once again, in no doubt, during the Feast of Tabernacles, Jesus claimed himself Messiah. He claimed himself the liberator, the savior, but in shocking statement, you embrace Israel's foreigners. In fact, you should note that God has often favored them over Israel's finest. You would favor the foreigners as well. Whereas people in Israel's time were celebrating liberation from years of displacement and oppression, Jesus now will go on to declare in scripture, in one scripture, in our scripture, that God will also bless the Gentiles. He is not only God of the Jews, he is God of the Gentiles. What freedom and restoration for whom now? Here is where the praise and joy of everyone present at the reading of Nazareth will turn into a gasp. And Jesus continues this teaching. <clears throat> but for now, I want you to hear and embody this first feeling of joy, this feeling of praise, glee, celebration, and victory. God has brought God's people home. They are now coming home. They are coming from the diaspora where they've been. And lives have been redeemed. I want you to feel the favor and praise for Jesus that every person in that synagogue was feeling as Jesus' reading of that scripture in his subsequent teaching. Spirit-powered anointing. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has now called me. He has anointed me. Spirit-powered mission. That is the lesson that they would miss because of what Jesus would say. They would not understand that he is anointed for a specific thing. This quote from Isaiah 1, verse 1 and 2, comes from the period of Ezra we have been talking about. It is a message of hope to the people struggling to rebuild Zion. It is good news for those who have, are weak and lowly. It is welcoming and inclusive. The initial reaction of the people was positive, but as it has been when Ezra read the law to the Israelites, all spoke were of him and were amazed at the gracious ways that came from his mouth in Luke 4 verse 22. 
as the meaning of Jesus' message sank in. However, the response was increasing hostile. Jesus illustrated the inclusiveness of his message with reference to scripture. Elijah was sent not to an Israelite widow, but to the widow of Zarephath. Who was this? Elisha did not heal a Jewish leper, but rather Naaman the Syrian. In verse 24 and 27. It is clear that of, of, for Jesus, the good news of salvation was universal and inclusive. This angered the people so that they drove him out of town and tried to kill him. If you read that, those verses to the end. They now wanted to kill him. But the message he was putting to them was a message for life, for salvation. Let us take no offense at this. Jesus comes to the poor, the captives, the blind, the oppressed. He has a preferential option for such people in need. But this is not an exclusive option. We can be committed to, in alignment and solidarity with, people in such need. For Jesus comes to set us free also. He also comes to set us free. While we are catering for the poor, we are catering for the blind, we are catering for the lowly people, he also comes to set us free. Maybe you may ask me, set us free from what? He comes to set us free from our pride. Which makes us think that we are better than people who are poor. When you are rich, you always think you are better than the poor people. He comes to set us free from our judgments of the poor, by which we convince ourselves that we are rich because of our industry. So the people must, who are poor must be less. He comes to set us free from the pride of race or ethnicity, by which we exalt ourselves and demean others, and we always think that we are better than other nations. He comes to set us free from our fear of the future, which causes us to become concerned only with our petty selves rather than those who are greater in need. It is possible for even middle class people to be set free to hear the word attentively as did the Israelites to weep in remorse and then to be set free for rejoicing. So he has come to set us free. What does he say? On the last verse from Nehemiah chapter 8 verse 10. Go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord and do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. And what does Jesus say at the end? Jesus says, today the scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. May God bless you as you think upon these words. Also, claim the Holy Spirit to anoint you as well. So that when you are anointed, we will impact the community that you are living in. You impact the society you are living in. The spirit anointed Christian will be seen by others doing great things in his life. May God help you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let us um, pray as we come to the end of our service. <clears throat> Heaven, Father, we come to you. We thank you. We offer our prayers for the world in which we live. We pray for the poor, those living in slums on the edges of many big cities, those that are poor because they do not know. They do not know you. Please guide us. Show us how to bring good news to the poor, both physically and spiritually. We pray for those held in prison, especially those held unjustly, perhaps as hostages, and those held prisoner by addictions and habits. Please guide us and show us how to bring release to prisoners, both physically and spiritually. We pray for the blind, for those who are physically cannot see, and those who cannot see the love that is around them. Please guide and show us how to bring sight to the blind, both physically and spiritually. We pray for the oppressed, for those who not are well, particularly suffering from mental illness, for the depressed, the fearful, the paranoid. Please guide and show us how to release the oppressed, both physically and spiritually. Finally, we pray for ourselves and our churches. Show us how we can proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and bring good news to all those around us. May the good Lord bless us, Father. 
as we continue to minister to one another. In Jesus' name, amen. Brothers and sisters, I would ask you and urge you to take your offering as you want to thank God. You commit yourself to God and say, whenever I hear the word of God, I want to take the opportunity to thank God for what God is doing in my life and to, so that the work of God continues to reach many people. Let us pray for our offerings. Heavenly Father, we bring our offerings to you. May you bless us, Father, as we bring these offerings. May they be used for your kingdom, for your ministry, for the mission of God, to help the poor, to help the blind, to help the prisoners, to help the oppressed. May this offering be used in your mission. Amen. So I urge you, brothers and sisters, after this, that you can remit your offerings uh, through the accounts that are given below. Please follow the link so that we continue to minister and do the work of God. May God bless you. Let us receive grace. Lord, we have been fed by your word. Send us out in the power of the Spirit with eyes to see what is wrong in your world, ears to listen to the troubled, and the hearts overwhelming with your love. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. God bless you all. In Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>